talk uh, today, particularly because, as has already been said, I'm something of an interloper. Uh, I'm currently at Cambridge, uh, working in the Centre for Quantum Information and Foundations. However, I'd like to talk about work that I did when I was a proper Londoner, um, together with Jonathan Halliwell uh, at Imperial and uh, Rayanne Hartshorn and Ariadne Whitby, who were at the time uh, fourth year undergraduate students. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the quantum backflow, which is uh, a, a fun and interesting quantum effect, not very well studied. Before I go into that, I just point out that if you want to ask me a question, stick your hand up, holler, by all means. Uh, but there is a, a reference to an article on the archive there, um, which does all this in a lot more detail. So by all means, ask me a question. But if there's something you don't catch, you can also uh, check out the details, hopefully, in the article. OK, so a quick plan of what I've got to talk about. I'm going to start with an introduction. Uh, what is this effect? A little bit about why it's peculiar and exciting. Um, and then, as you'll see, it's an effect involving wave functions in quantum mechanics, and one might be tempted to think that uh, it only involves strange, exotic wave functions, really odd things you wouldn't expect to find in a lab. Uh, and so I will give a simple example um, of a very simple state that has this property to kind of immediately disprove that. It's also interesting because this quantum effect, as I've come to, has not been experimentally verified yet. Um, and this particular simple example might be amenable to experimental text. That's an interesting point. Um, I'll then get a little bit more into the mathematical detail. So I'll frame this problem as a particular eigenvalue problem. Um, and I'll explain some properties. Uh, as we'll see when we, we express this as an eigenvalue problem, it's a quantum effect with a particularly subtle classical limit. Okay. So the classical limit of this effect is by no means obvious. And I'll explain that in some detail, but I'll talk a bit about this classical limit. And then I'll address the interesting and fraught question of whether or not you could actually measure this in a realistic experiment and what you might expect such a realistic experiment to, to give. And then I'll conclude at the end. OK, so, so what is this backflow effect? Here's a simple, um, a simple explanation. I'm not... Imagine I initially have some quantum state that's constructed entirely out of positive momentum. So I can do that. And imagine that at some initial time, it's concentrated in x less than 0. So it can't have support entirely in x less than 0, but imagine that it's peaking there. And then what I'm interested in is the probability of finding the state still in x less than 0 at some subsequent time. Okay, now, your classical intuition says this is made entirely out of positive momentum. Therefore, it should be flowing to the left, as you see it there. Therefore, this probability should decrease in time. It should be monotonically decreasing. In fact, that isn't true, uh, and you find in some situations that this probability can increase in time. Or to put it another way, the, the standard quantum mechanical current at the origin can be negative, and so this probability flows backwards in the wrong direction. Uh, this is where the name backflow effect comes from. Okay. So here's a pretty picture. Uh, so this is a particular state uh, that, that displays this backflow effect. And what I'm plotting here is the probability of being found in x less than 0 as a function of time. And so you can see globally, it, incre it decreases from negative times to positive times. The trend is for it to go down. But during this intermediate period from t uh, minus 1 to 1 on that graph, the probability of fact increases. So this is a great example of this. OK, so let's, let's try and define in a slightly mathematically more precise way what I mean by this. So let's introduce these projection operators. So I have p, which is a theta function onto positive x, and then uh, p bar, which is, which is 1 minus p. Um, and the quantity I'm interested in is the flux, or what would be the, the probability of crossing the origin during some time period, um, which can be expressed either as a difference of two projectors uh, or in terms of the flux at the boundary integrated over time. OK, and in, in case you're not in case you've forgotten your, your one-dimensional quantum mechanics, here is this, this flux operator, this current operator. Okay. And as I said, because all the momenta are positive, you'd expect this thing to be positive. Okay. So there's, that's another reason why you have this slightly... Well, this is an unexpected effect. However, at this top formula here, so this flux is, is a difference between two probabilities. So it doesn't have to be positive. It can be negative, as I've written it there. Um, but it's certainly positive when these behave according to classical intuition. And as I said, that the backflow effect is essentially that this quantity can take negative values even for 
that states can compose entirely out of P greater than zero. And I don't want to talk about uh, interesting effects in, in the quantum mechanics of space-time regions or, or questions in quantum mechanics involving time in a non-trivial way. Um, but let me very briefly say that one of the ways in which this, this quantity comes uh, can appear in physical problems, if I go back a, a step, okay. So suppose I want to know about the probability of the distribution of times of which this state crosses the origin. Okay. Um, and classically, you would say, okay, well, what that is, is it's just current. The current density at the origin gives me the probability distribution for crossing. Okay. But clearly, the backflow effect is telling me that this is stupid because this number that's supposed to be a probability distribution can be negative. Okay. So this, this finds, it, it crops up in, in various problems involving time in a non-trivial way in quantum but I won't have anything further to say about that today. Okay, so here is an effect, strange quantum effect. Some questions. Okay, the first one is what sort of states display the backflow effect? Um, I've mentioned that they're not just exotic states, but is there anything more I can say about these states? The second question is, well, how big can this effect be? Um, and how long can it last? They're good questions. Uh, another subtle question, is it measurable? Okay, so would I actually be expected, would I actually expect to be able to observe this in a realistic experiment? And then again, this is clearly a non, this is clearly a very non-classical effect, it's a quantum effect, so how does it vanish in the classical limit? It's a valid question as well. So I'll, I'll sort of address each one of these in time. Okay, so the backflow effect is not just about really pathological states. So here is an example of a state you might think is quite nice or semi-classical. So here is just a superposition of two Gaussians with different momenta, um, uh, the same width, but different momenta at different positions. And what I'm doing is plotting the, the current at the origin as a function of time. And you can see here that it has these periods where the current is negative. Okay, so this is a state explaining the backflow effect. And here I plotted again this probability of being found in x less than zero as a function of time. Uh, and again, globally it decreases, but it has these funny wiggles. And in fact, on the next slide, here is a, a zoomed-in version of one of these wiggles. And again, lo and behold, you can just about make out that the probability does increase during this time. Okay. And if you go away and compute how much the probability increases in this time interval, I put in some likely-looking values for the momenta and, uh, and momentum spread of these states, and I find that the, the, probabil the probability can increase uh, by, what's that, it's about, almost about half a percent. Which obviously immediately raises the question, okay, so here is one particular number. Uh, is, this, is this a good number? Is this, is this a lot of black flow? Is this a little bit of black flow? You know, how, how representative is this? How big can the effect be? Okay, so it doesn't just happen for, for exotic states. However, we're going to mainly focus on exotic states. We're going to look for maximum black flow states in the rest of this talk. Okay. So, I'm now interested in, in finding out how big this effect can be. I know it exists, I'd like to know, you know the, the maximum size of this effect. So to that end, I'll frame this as an eigenvalue problem following a seminal paper of Bracken and Malloy. Uh, I'll give the reference down here if you're interested. Okay, so we have this flux, uh, now expressed as an operator acting on a particular state, and I'm looking at this as an eigenvalue equation, so I want to know what the eigenstates and eigenvalues are of this. And the spectrum, uh, I would expect it to be between 0 and 1. Okay, that's the kind of the bit that obeys your classical intuition. Um, and what I'm saying is that backflow means that there is a lower bound to this spectrum that is negative. Okay, and I'll call this CBM, it's some Brecken and Malloy uh, constant. Okay. Now, I want to frame this as an eigenvalue problem. It's useful to do this in momentum space. So writing this equation in momentum space gives you this. Um, but now you notice that by some judicious rescaling, actually it's just equivalent to this equation here. Okay. So that's some fairly, fairly boring rescaling. What's interesting about this equation on the bottom is that uh, it doesn't, this equation and therefore the eigenvalues don't depend on h-bar or the mass or even the time interval. Okay. So all the eigenvalues in this, this spectrum, in particular the lowest eigenvalue, this CBM, um, they're dimensionless quantum numbers that don't depend on h-bar or anything else. Okay. 
So in particular, Bracken and Malloy said that this lower bound is a new dimensionless quantum number, uh, and is, is rather exciting. And it, uh, to give a game away, it's not like pi over 2. <laughs> okay, right. Now this eigenvalue problem is extremely difficult to tackle analytically. I would thoroughly invite anyone who's very good at mathematical physics to try and sort this and put me out of a job. Um, but no one's managed to do it so far, so I'm not holding my breath. However, it's relatively easily solved numerically. So, I don't expect you to take away a lot from this, but here is a plot of what the maximum backflow state looks like in momentum space. Okay, so it's some kind of, it, it has a peak around p equals zero, and it has some kind of oscillating behavior for large, p, large values in momentum. Okay, and numerically, you can calculate what this backflow constant is, uh, and it's about 4%. Okay, so you can see actually that my previous example with Gaussians was pretty rubbish. It's actually, I managed to get about 16% of the theoretical maximum backflow. Um, so this is, and again, let me just point out that the spectrum is, is this, and it's believed, well, it's known that it's continuous in this interval. Okay, so this is the, the expected one. It's believed that it's discrete for negative values of lambda, although that's only known numerically. Uh, and I'll also point out that for very large values of the momenta, the state looks like something like sine p squared over p. Um, it has that sort of asymptotic decaying form. Uh, and if you want some references for this uh, numerical work, the first one is uh, Evanson, Fuster, and Virch, and the second one is uh, Penns et al. And they do this in excruciating uh, detail, and they're very thorough about it. But I'm not going to get. Okay. So here is a plot of the current that you obtain from this maximum backflow state. And this looks a lot more striking than the example we had for the Gaussians. So here is my current as a function of time. It sort of disappears up to some asymptote, and then I have a huge region of negative current between minus 1 and 1. Uh, it's symmetric, by the way, because uh, this, in this eigenvalue problem, I can choose the eigenfunctions to be real uh, because of the way this problem works out. So this, everything is now symmetric in time. OK. And again, here is a nice, uh, a nice plot displaying this result. So here is the plot of the probability of being in excess of zero as a function of time. And again, it decays, increases a bit, and then disappears off. Um, and the maximum amount by which it can increase is exactly this bracket of the law number. Okay. Now, I don't want to go into... So where are the places where it, where it has this transition? Is that one on your... On uh, one and minus one, yeah. So they're, but, they're, it, it doesn't come up very well in this plot, but they're here. But that must mean... But the current diverges, but the probability doesn't necessarily. And what's one spot, minus one? What's special about one? Oh, nothing. Uh, so... Scale. So, so the, this is the original eigenvalue equation, and I basically have scaled out the time. Yeah. So it, it's mm. of no particular significance. So, as I said, uh, an analytic solution of this eigenvalue problem is not known, but you can have some fun choosing states that seem to match this, this eigenfunction very well. Um, so here's one that I've chosen, which is a sum of an exponential bit and some Fresnel cosine functions. Uh, it seems to do pretty well, and, and you get a current that looks like this. So this is, this, the amount of backflow I get for this particular choice is about 70% of the maximum. So it's not brilliant, but it is analytically known this wave function. So, I mean, it's it's nice you can play with these things and compute the current exactly. Okay. When I was talking about um, framing this eigenvalue problem, I mentioned that uh, the the eigenvalues are dimensionless; they don't depend on h bar. Now, many people you find it in the textbooks. When they talk about the classical limit of quantum theory, they say things like, in the limit when h bar goes to zero, we should recover classical mechanics, classical physics. Um, and it's slightly naive, but it's certainly obvious that there's going to be a problem in this case. This is a, a very, a very quantum, a quantum effect, it's a sort of interference effect, it's this backflow. But because these the lower bound on the spectrum doesn't depend on h bar, it's not clear that it will go to zero when the limit h bar goes to zero. So it's not clear what the classical limit of this effect is. Okay. Of course, as I said, this is a huge oversimplification of what we mean by the classical limit of quantum mechanics. 
So, what could I mean by the classical limit? Well, I have, I have two ideas, okay. The first one is to say, well, okay, really what I mean by the classical limit of a system is I take my system that I'm interested in uh, and I, I make it interact with an environment and I look at the behavior of the reduced density matrix of my system when it's interacting with a big environment. Um, so imagine immersing, immersing our bath, which is uh, our system, which is some particle, uh, in a big old heat bath, um, uh, let it interact and then trace out the heat bath and see what the behavior of the particle is. And you can show that for any initial state, uh, after some, uh, some initial time period, there's no backflow. Okay. So this system does have a classical limit in the sense of open quantum systems. Uh, the details are in this paper, if you're interested. However, it's not obvious that I really need the heavy machinery of open quantum systems here. I started with some wave function in 1D quantum mechanics. I really need to go to a Brownian motion, quantum Brownian motion to look at the classical limit. Purists might say yes, but I'd still like something a little simpler if I can. So my second approach to the classical limit is to ask the question, well, why is this Bracken and Malloy constant? Why is it dimensionless number? Why does it depend on h-bar? And the reason is simple, there are only three parameters in my problem. I have a mass, I have a time scale, and I have h-bar. And there isn't a way of constructing a dimensionless combination of these. There's no, you know, there's no product of these things raised to various powers that's dimensionless. So there's no possible way that I can get a value of the flux out of these things, which is a dimensionless number the value of the flux. What do I need to make a dimensionless number? Uh, well, I need a length scale, or a momentum scale equivalent. Aha, you might say. But when I, when I introduced this flux, I, I said it was the difference between two projection operators at different moments in time. But these projection operators are infinitely sharp measurements. They're ideal measurements. Mm -hmm. So maybe therein lies the difference. So what I could do is I could look at replacing my projection operator with a P of VM. Uh, and there are lots of ways I could do that. But imagine I did that by taking my projection operator onto x greater than 0 and convolving it with some Gaussian of width sigma. Okay. And I get something like this as a, as a nice standard P of the M. And this has some width sigma, which I think I've chosen to be more. Okay, what happens to my, to my eigenvalue equation for backflow in this case? Well, you can go away and, and, uh, and, and work it out in the same way as for the original eigenvalue equation, and you get this. Okay, so this looks rather similar to before. I have this funny sign uh, sort of sync business, um, but now I have a new, a new piece. I have this exponential suppression term, and the point is now that I have this this number a, it's a dimensionless number, which is made up of mass h bar t and some length scale sigma, which came from my p over the a. Fantastic. Now it's meaningful to talk about h bar goes to zero because h bar goes to zero just means a goes to infinity. Okay, so now I can have a sensible classical limit of this. Um, so now I can ask, well, what's the most negative eigenvalue of this equation now, once I introduce this length scale? And here is plot. So this is plotting the value of the most negative eigenvalue as a function of a. So I have a increasing. Um, and lo and behold, it seems to asymptote up to zero. And in fact, you can show for large values of a uh, that lambda as a function of a is the most negative. I should have. The most negative eigenvalue is a function of a, the size of it goes like 1 over a squared. Okay. So, so this is sort of good. Okay. So clearly I have the, the backflow effect, the size of the backflow effect goes to zero when I introduce this length scale, or when I take h bar to zero equivalently. Um, but it, it's not quite as subtle as that. I mean, this is not this is not zero for any value of, of a, at least as I've plotted it. So the backflow effect doesn't exactly disappear. Uh, it maybe just becomes a measurable, who can say? OK, so that brings me nicely to the question of whether or not I would expect to be able to observe this. So I've told you about a mathematical effect in quantum mechanics. It's very interesting. It's counterintuitive. But is it just mathematical posturing? Could I actually observe this with some sort of you know, in, in some lab that I could tell some competent experimentalists to go away and, and measure something, would they see the backflow effect? Well, there are two questions. Okay, the first is, 
is there actually any way of observing this at all? So, as a physicist, a theoretical physicist, can I write down some measurement that will give me the right answer? And then, of course, I have to worry about realistic measurements. So the answer to the first question is yes, okay. This flux that I gave you is a difference between probabilities at two times. So all I need is I need two copies of my system, or preferably 2n copies of my system, a big number of copies, um, and I measure p at t1 on one copy, p at t2 on the other, take away the difference, uh, and, and eventually I should find the, the, uh, the backflow effect if I choose these times right in the states. Okay. And I can simplify things a bit by doing this measurements with condensates, and then I basically have one. My condensate acts like one big ensemble. So I could just do two measurements on two different condensations. I should see this answer. Okay, so there's some hope. What about if I was to do this for a realistic measurement? Now, the problem here is that um, I, I framed this in terms of the probability for, for crossing the origin during some given time interval. Now, suppose I have a detector at the, at the origin. Well, it can click, or it can not click, but it can't unclick. So I can't, I can't click into the detector and then fly off backwards again. That's clearly not allowed. So once I introduce a detector, I'm going to change the behavior of the wave function in some way, and I need to check that I can actually still see the backflow effect in this case. So a reasonable model for a realistic measurement device is the inclusion of an imaginary absorbing potential. So um, what I'm claiming here, and you'll have to take my word for it, is that if I really went away and modelled some proper measuring device, maybe with some lasers, so it was exciting, um, and then I, I traced out the details of the measuring device, in some limit I actually get this. So this is a bold claim, but in some limit uh, the behaviour of my particle looks like a free particle with an imaginary absorbing potential. So what's happening here is the particle's coming along, hitting this potential, and then disappearing, so the norm's disappearing because it's disappearing off into other channels and being absorbed by some stuff or a screen or whatever. Okay, so now what I'm interested in is the survival probability. So that says, given that my measuring device is set up to absorb the particle, um, what's the probability that the particle hasn't been absorbed after some time? Okay, so this is it's just a norm at that time. And then I can say that the arrival time probability, or, or the the flux across the surface in this modified measurement model mm. is just the rate of change of the uh, just the rate of change of the model. Um, and because of the way this is set up, this is an explicit and positive thing. So minus the rate of the change of the norm has to be greater than zero or equal to zero. And in fact, if you if you uh, go away and compute what this is, and the details are in this paper, um, you find that it looks like the following. It looks like uh, the current at a particular moment in time, but then I've smeared it somehow with some exponential term. And this, this exponential term comes from the measuring device. Now, as it stands, this looks like a problem because this probability is going to be positive, of course, and um, so how am I going to see my negative backflow? There are two ways you might see it. The first is that you could just look at the behavior of the measuring device and you might see some particular features. You might see a delay, for instance, in the time at which you expect it to detect, and that would be some um, that could be a signature that you had backflow. But actually, I've written this in a particularly nice way. And this is only valid in the limit of very weak measurements, I should point out. But in this limit, what this expression looks like is it looks like a convolution. So I have my current at some time convolved with a function that depends on the apparatus on the measurement device. Now this is good because it means that I can actually extract the current by doing a deconvolution. So I take Fourier transforms and divide by this measuring this function of the measuring device because I know what that is, um, and, uh, and and then I should be able to extract the current exactly. Okay. So to that end, let me plot what the measured current uh, would look like. So so uh, yeah. So this, uh, let me plot what the arrival time distribution would look like, which is this current convolved. So here I do, I've got three plots. The blue one is the uh, original current I had before for, um, uh, with, without worrying about the details of the measuring device, this is the exact thing. Um, which you can also think of as being, uh, which you can also think of as being this, this original expression where I take V0 to infinity. And then I have two other curves. The gold curve is for some particular small value of V0, and the red curve is for an even smaller one. So what you see is that as soon as I introduce this measuring device and I make 
the value of the potential small enough, lo and behold, the, the detection probability is positive. Okay. Um, but it has this interesting feature in that it, it does nevertheless decay during this period when there's backflow. So you would see a delay compared to when you'd expect to see the wave function arrive. Um, but also I'm claiming that even with this entirely positive probability distribution, one can recover the negative current by some straightforward uh, mathematical process. Okay, so that's good. So, so this is roughly what I said before. So my, measure, um, so my probability detection is always positive, however it can be extracted from the results of a realistic experiment. Note here that I didn't say anything about the length of time over which my state can display backflow. And the reason for that is because this time scaled out of the problem. But if you look at why the time scales out of the problem, you'll find that if, if I give you a state with backflow over some particular time period, then by scaling the momentum, and thus the energy, you can give me another state that has backflow over a smaller or larger time period. Okay. So there's no sense in which there's a, a, a limiting time over which this effect can occur. However, that involves some scaling of the momentum, um, and thus the energy. It's not clear that that's a physical thing to do. Really, I give you a state of some energy, and I want to know some properties of that state. Um, it's not known for a given state uh, how long backflow can persist, but this expression here gives you a clue. Because what I'm doing is taking the current and I'm smearing it over some interval that's, that's roughly of size 1 over v0 in time. And because I know that v0 has to be much less than e, this actually strongly suggests that backflow can only last for a time much less than 1 over e. So this isn't a proof as yet, but this suggests that the length of time over which I can get backflow is actually bounded for a given state. Okay, so some open questions. Okay. We have not by any means addressed all of the things that you might find interesting about this problem. So these open questions roughly fall into two classes, the first of which are mathematical. Okay. So is there an analytic solution to this eigenvalue equation? Uh, is it impossible or is it just that I'm not clever enough? And, and consequently, is there an explicit formula for the maximum backflow? So I said it's not pi over 2. Uh, it's not one of E either, but I kind of got bored after that point. So it could be some combination of, of, uh, of you know, known numbers and it might have some nice interpretation, who knows. Another question that I mentioned is, okay, given some simple properties of the state, for instance, the first three moments, the Hamiltonian, something like that, uh, is there a bound on the size of backflow? This is relevant because, um, as I said, this backflow effect arises in, in things like the arrival time problem. Um, and there you're typically, uh, backflow means that you can't define an arrival time distribution in terms of the current. So it's a limiting factor that stops you from being able to do things in quantum mechanics you'd like to be able to do. So it'd be useful to know if there's some bound. So if, if you give me some state, can I tell you whether or not there'll be a problem with that state? And that's an open question. Um, but then there are also some physical questions as well that I might like to answer. The first of which is, I described how you might uh, measure backflow by doing um, experiments on different ensembles at different times. I also described how you might do it via some realistic detector that you're waiting to go play. Um, but can I actually do some, some measurement that will give me a direct measurement of backflow? So is there some way that I can look at the system and see that the local momentum uh, is negative when I would expect it to be positive? And I'm no expert on this, but I think that you can via the framework of weak measurement. There is some way of doing a weak measurement on a system that looks directly and tells you what the local momentum density is. So that's an interesting thing to explore. And then there's another physical question, which is kind of related to the foundations of this, which is, well, why? how is this effect significant? How is backflow significant for histories-based interpretations of quantum mechanics in particular? Um, uh, so there's some evidence that, that the time scale on which this backflow occurs gives you the bound of the accuracy with which you can uh, define histories for, for crossing or not crossing or entering. Um, and it would be good to know a little bit more about the foundational significance of this and whether it says deep things about the pathological approach to quantum mechanics, for example. Okay, so let me just summarize. Um, so we've explored some aspects of the backflow effect, okay? Not all of them by any means. This is an interesting effect, and it's not been very well studied before. I think there are about five or six papers in the world that deal with this effect. So it's, it's 
not received anything like as much attention as it could have done. Okay, and I've shown you some simple examples of some states we've backed up. These could be relevant if anyone in the audience is an experimentalist, because um, they give you some indication that you might actually be able to prepare states in a lab that can display back to them. Um, I then explored how this might be expressed as an eigenvalue problem, and I've numerically given you some account of the maximum amount of backflow, this funny quantum number, uh, and, and a vague indication of what the maximum backflow state might look like. Uh, and then I've talked a little bit about the classical limit of backflow. This is interesting because it gets into this whole subtlety around what the classical limit of quantum mechanics is. And it, it's an example of a another example of a system that has a subtle classical limit. Okay, and then I've sort of sketched that you might actually be able to observe this in a realistic detector model as well. Um, which is nice because that gives you some hope that people in labs really can go away. Okay, so I'm going to end there, hopefully with some time for some questions. Um, I mean, there's this specifically to do with quantum mechanics, and isn't it just the property of, of um, wave patterns? In some sense, yes. So you could do, if you could have an optical um, setup. Yeah. So this is related to. So, so the general problem here is: is suppose I have some, um, I, I suppose I have some operator that I think I have that has a certain spectrum. So in this case, I have the momentum, and the spectrum of the momentum is zero to infinity. Uh, and I measure something like the current which you expect to be related to the momentum, but the spectra don't overlap. Yeah. So this is related to, in um, optics, the phenomena of super oscillations. Where in super oscillations you have um, essentially two, uh, two waves that are oscillating with different time scales, um, but the sum of these waves can, have some, can be oscillating with some time scale that's nowhere related to these two, or, or way outside the spectrum of what you expect. So this does have an optical analog, yeah. In fact, uh, Michael Berry wrote a paper on backflow quite recently, uh, in which he, he pointed out some of these, these similarities between different things. Um, so yeah, there's certainly, there's certainly a connection there to be explored. Any questions? Yeah, it's not the same, but probably the same. Uh, only I wanted to say that uh, maybe there is a, I don't know, do you, do you consider it in, in one dimensional or, or in two dimensional? Uh, yeah. This is in one dimension, but it, it doesn't, it can be generalized to, to higher dimensions with no real I mean, the, yeah, the, the, details, the details are different, clearly, but the basic, the basic idea doesn't change. Because I, I want to just say that maybe the so called the topological invariant which appears to in the wave function, which creates such a constant value. Yeah, that's, it's, it's possible. Again, uh, Michael Berry's paper, started to explore some of these issues um, but but yeah there, there's no clear answer to exactly you know if this is a topological effect there's no clear answer to that so. <coughs> any more questions yes yes uh, yeah uh, you said that there are very few papers dealing with fish for the dark flow but are you aware that in the chemical physics community people is using these ideas in the ages? <laughs> Uh, the, the idea of backflow, or...? Yeah, the flow of nature and all these things just to disentangle what goes ahead and goes all backwards and so on. So I know that... Um, uh, yeah, so I know that in the, in the chemical physics community there's a lot of interest in, in flux operators, and in particular um, defining the length of time that products spend in various states. So there's a lot of interest in flux-flux correlation functions for defining time you spend in the region, uh, which is all connected to this, yeah. But I, forgive me for saying, there's a lot of discussion of this in the chemistry community, but it's not necessarily, it's an interesting fact that's been observed, but not really, no one's really gone into any detail about how you might explain it. But you're absolutely right, there is a lot of discussion in the chemical physics community, of, um, particularly using fluxes for defining probabilities of, of transitioning between things, yeah. Well, there's also a co inversion of all this stuff. There's also, it's a Gaumian version, because you can define flows. Yes, Yeah, absolutely. In fact, this effect is, uh, I don't want to say it's less, it's less difficult to understand, but it's certainly obvious in Bohmian theory, because just because I have a state with momentum that's positive, that doesn't mean that the Bohmian trajectory is going in one direction. So this has an obvious interpretation in Bohm theory. Um, yeah, that's certainly true. Yeah, because you, you, you said that before by 
do you think I have work on there? I'm sure if I mean, because he treated also this problem from the point of view of how Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I didn't point out that paper in the references, but yes, he has a paper on this. Any more questions? If not, I think it's time for a, for a coffee break. We seem to be back on our original schedule, so I suggest we, we start again at half past three. So let's let's go to coffee and thank both of our speakers for this. <laughs>